Hello, I am District Judge Edward Chen of the United States District Court for the Northern District of California in San Francisco. The Japanese internment is an especially appropriate theme for the 2017 Ninth Circuit Civics Contest. Most of the events that took place in the winter of 1942 occurred in states that make up the Ninth Circuit. Most of those who were relocated had been living along the West Coast and the government's largest internment camps were in Arizona and California. Most importantly, perhaps, the federal courts of the Ninth Circuit heard the first legal challenges to the military's authority to impose a curfew on people of Japanese descent and to forcibly relocate them to primitive camps in remote places. This video features interviews with three federal judges from the Ninth Circuit who are particularly knowledgeable about the Japanese internment and its legal aftermath. The Honorable Mary M. Schroeder is a senior judge and the former chief judge of the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit. The Honorable Marilyn Hall Patel, now retired, is a former chief judge of the U.S. District Court for the Northern District of California. They will discuss two landmark cases to emerge from the Japanese internment. Gordon K. Hirabayashi, a college student in Seattle, and Fred T. Korematsu, a steelyard worker in San Francisco Bay Area, were both convicted of violating the wartime relocation order. Hirabayashi also was convicted of violating a curfew restricting the movements of Japanese Americans. Judges Schroeder and Patel entered into the cases more than four decades later when both men were seeking to be exonerated of the charges through writs of quorum nobis. I was a lawyer at the time and take great pride in having been a member of the legal team that achieved vindication for them. Before turning to the legal legacy though, we thought it might interest you to hear from someone who experienced the internment firsthand. The Honorable A. Wallace Tashima is also a senior judge of the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals. Judge Tashima spent part of his childhood living with his family in an internment camp in Arizona. He will reflect upon the experience and how it influenced him to pursue a career in the law. We were interned in uh, May of 1942. Uh, I was born in 1934, so that was one month uh, before my eighth birthday. Everyone can remember when they were in the, you know, that age, uh, second, third, fourth grade, and uh, you don't have too many cares in the world. Uh, we were living in Los Angeles, in East LA, and it's the first time really I had to get out to the country. We spent a lot of time, uh, you know, this internment camp was right on the Colorado, right next to the Colorado River. We used to go down to the river almost every weekend. And I know I used to tell my mother, uh, when I, at times when I came home, I said, well, well, mom, I swam to California today. My mother, who was the only adult in our family, you know, she, she, she didn't particularly show that she was upset, but you know, I think, uh, I think camp was a much more of a hardship for adults than it was for children. You know, a lot of them uh, 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 really uh, gave up a way of life. They gave up their belongings, uh, they gave up their possessions. You know, w when we came, when we boarded the train, uh, to go to the camp and we didn't know where we were going, every, every person could just, you know, you can just take what you could carry. So one suitcase. And you, you go with one, one suitcase not, not knowing, uh, you know, where you're going or how long you're gonna stay. Besides being deprived of, uh, I think, you know, worldly goods, I think more so than that was the worry, worry on their mind, well, will I ever get to go back home? I was in camp for, uh, I remember three years and three months. So in August of 45, uh, we went back to Los Angeles, where we were from. And uh, we moved back to, to our old house. Uh, and it, it had been, you know, not in a trustee sh ship, but, you know, someone had been taking care of it, had been rented. And, and we were able to do that. Uh, many people, you know, uh, they lost their uh, household goods. If you had an automobile, you had to sell it, you know, at, at, uh, in a hurry because the government said, uh, well, you know, you're scheduled to leave in uh, two weeks, and uh, you know, if you didn't have your car sold, it would just be sitting on the street. Uh, I know my father-in-law, who was a, a, a pretty successful grocer, he had a great big uh, uh, charge business. In other words, he, he, he had a lot of uh, farm worker uh, customers. Uh, when they found out that he was leaving, uh, 
I think they thought, well, it was, you know, it was, it was a holiday because they wouldn't have to pay him because he would be gone. And he lost, I think, what today would be, you know, equivalent to probably close to a million dollars. Uh, you know, something isn't right, for instance, when uh, you're in this uh, internment camp where you can't leave, and yet uh, young men were still being drafted. And, uh, you know, they would, you know, some would come back, a few would not come back because they were killed in action. Uh, in the camp, we used to have, uh, they used to show free movies. You know, outdoor, it was in the outdoors, in the desert, always hot, outdoor movies. Sometimes, you know, before a movie started, uh, they would, uh, uh, an ar army officer would uh, get up uh, on the stage before the screen and, uh, and award a, a posthumous uh, medal for bravery. And some little lady would get up and, you know, and, and get the medal uh, for her son who was killed. And uh, that struck me as an awfully strange, e even as a kid, as an awfully strange scene to see, you know, something like that happening. So Korematsu, you know, is a case that every law student reads. I also think it's, uh, it's probably a unanimous opinion amongst uh, almost, I think, every lawyer, every judge, every legal scholar that uh, uh, every, er every list you'll ever see of the 10 worst decisions of the Supreme Court, Korematsu is one of them. I don't think anybody uh, defends the rightness or the justice of that decision. The problem is, you know, if it happens once, uh, it can happen again. And so uh, I think what, what all of us should do, particularly judges should do, is, is you know, is to guard against uh, those kinds of things uh, com coming to happen again. I, I think that's the a, that's a main, uh, uh, main reason I think, I, think I, I wanted to be a judge. Gordon Hirabayashi's trial took place in the U.S. District Court for the Western District of Washington. Fred Korematsu's trial took place in the Northern District of California. Both men appealed their convictions to the Ninth Circuit, which heard the cases but declined to issue rulings, citing the need for the U.S. Supreme Court's guidance on a jurisdictional question. In separate decisions in 1943 and in 1944, the Supreme Court affirmed the convictions of Hirabayashi and Korematsu, thereby upholding the constitutionality of the military's relocation program. The conviction stood until the 1980s when researchers discovered documents showing the government had knowingly presented false evidence to the Supreme Court in support of its arguments that relocating people of Japanese descent had been a, quote, military necessity, close quote. Korematsu returned to court in the Northern District of California seeking justice. Judge Patel overturned his conviction, finding the government's failure to refute the documents was, quote, tantamount to a confession of error, close quote. The government did not appeal. Hirabayashi returned to the Western District of Washington court where a judge threw out one conviction for violating the relocation order, but upheld the other for violating the curfew. Both Hirabayashi and the government appealed, leading to the Ninth Circuit historic 1987 decision in which a unanimous three-judge panel ordered the lower court to void the curfew conviction. The ruling, the first by any appellate court, was written by Judge Schroeder. I remembered studying in law school about a rib of quorum novus, but uh, I had been on the state court and then on the federal court for a short period of time, and I'd never seen a writ of quorum novus. It, uh, it's used only now in criminal cases, and it's when other forms of relief or remedies are not available, one turns to uh, the writ of quorum novus to have the court correct something that had happened in the past. And what this uh, case, as it was, as it appeared before me, was really a testament to how important it is for lawyers to know what the rules are and how, and what rules we're supposed to be playing by. We have rules of procedure. We have rules of evidence. In this case, both of those came into play. But in this case, uh, the government sought to, to move to dismiss a case that. Mr. Korematsu had been found guilty of, been convicted, and then 
uh, sentenced and served his time and had served his time years and years before, you know, in the, in the, in the completed a sentence and sometime in the early 1940s. Uh, and as I explained to the government, that procedure could not be used. So I denied their motion to dismiss. They then offered uh, Mr. Um, Korematsu uh, a pardon. And uh, Mr. Korematsu, sometime thereafter, after the case was over, was heard to say that if anybody should offer a pardon, he should offer the government a pardon, perhaps. And whether he would grant it, I, I don't know what his re response would have been to that. But he, of course, did not want a pardon. He wanted the conviction set aside. Because if you get a pardon, a, a conviction, you know, you still have that, had had that conviction. But, um, there were a lot of documents that were needed from the government, including the documents that supported certain findings that had been made by a commission that was appointed by the president. Um, to look into what had happened, and they found all kinds of records about misrepresentations that had been made um, to the lower courts and to the Supreme Court. What we found, and what was part of the record before me, was that, in fact, these, both the U.S. Attorney's Office, the FBI, others knew that, in fact, some of the representations being made to the Supreme Court about the danger on the West Coast was not, in fact, the case. Interestingly enough, now the Supreme Court decided the case. There were three dissents. There was one concurrence. But the three dissenters um, were very, very troubled by what they saw. You know, it boldly said, and baldly said in, in the cases themselves, in their dissents, that um, this was an indicia of racism. Four cases went to the Supreme Court, Hirabayashi, Yasui, Endo, and Korematsu. All four of those people were not only U.S. citizens, they had been born in the United States, and yet they faced curfew, um, having to report f to these internment camps or to a what they called a relocation center, and then they were interned. And, and even one of the Supreme Court justices who dissented referred to them not just as internment camps, but said they are in fact, or were in fact concentration camps. The government had stalled. They had not come forward with a, a real response to the petition. They did something, though, that um, the government can do that would affect, uh, a, you know, essentially granting the petition almost automatically and that is confess error. If they, it's called confession of error, where they say, we, we, they come in and they say, we made a mistake for whatever reason, whether it was factual or, or legally, and uh, we're confessing error, and essentially that would result in a setting aside of the conviction, or vacating the conviction, which is what Mr. Korematsu was asking for. Um, so what I found was that they had done everything but actually use the terms confession of error. So uh, I said it's tantamount to uh, constituting a, you know, uh, a confession of error, and I granted the petition. In uh, Gordon Hirabayashi's case, he was, he was convicted of two crimes. One was refusing to uh, obey the curfew that was imposed originally, and the other was to um, refuse to obey the order of, for relocation, to report for relocation, or what we now call the internment. And he was convicted of both. And when he challenged his cases in the district court, the district court split the difference. The district court, the district judge, trial judge, who was in Seattle in the same position as Judge Patel, said, well, I agree with the government that the uh, curfew case probably isn't very important, but the refusal to uh, report for the uh, uh, relocation is more important, so I'm going to dismiss one and I'm going to grant relief in the other case. Now why would he do that? And I've thought over the years that the reason he did it was to make sure that there would be an appeal, because uh, Judge Patel's case was not appealed. And the, and the judge in the Hirabayashi case wanted to make sure it went up another, at least another level to the Court of Appeals. It was very interesting that my uh, law clerk, who was going through the cases for, uh, for the month in Seattle, where, when we were sitting a few months before, he was just going through the names. He said, 
judge came to me, judge, this is, this is the Hirabayashi case. And I said, oh, there are lots of people named Hirabayashi. You've got to be kidding. This can't be the Hirabayashi case. And he said, yes, yes, it is. He came into my office waving this file and said, it is the Hirabayashi case. And then we were off to the races. When, when our case came down in the Ninth Circuit, which was a published appellate decision uh, uh, saying that the internment essentially was unconstitutional, uh, the government did not appeal. And uh, Mr. Hirabayashi, whom I came to know very well, was the most courageous person I've ever known, uh, was furious. He was just furious that the government didn't appeal because uh, he wanted his, uh, his, his conviction uh, to have be overturned by the Supreme Court, and he wanted vindication by, this, by the court that had treated him so unjustly in the first place. We had a very... Um, uh, 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 diverse panel that included um, an African American and it included uh, a, a judge who had been, uh, uh, was a veteran of World War II and had actually been in the Pacific prepared to invade Japan uh, at the time that the bombs were dropped. So that he had a, we had very different uh, experiences that we brought to bear on this case, which is one of the strengths of our appellate court system, is that when you have three judges with, with different kinds of experiences, a woman, an African American, and a World War II veteran, and they all agree on, on, that this was a grave injustice, it has, it, it's, it's very powerful. We'd had so many requests of people wanting to come to the court, and we knew it was going to be very crowded, so we used the ceremonial courtroom, and it was packed. And when I announced my decision, uh, just orally and very briefly, there wasn't a dry eye in the courtroom. I did ask Mr. Korematsu when I found out that he might be willing to, to say something if he wanted to be heard. After all, he'd waited all these years. My, uh, and he did want to be heard, and he got up and he spoke. And it was just very, very moving. I think that um, Gordon Hirabayashi was a little more outspoken than Fred Korematsu in his... Fred was very shy. <laughs> yes. Very he, shy. He was but very shy. He, he got out there after a while. He was all mm -hmm. over the country talking yep. to law schools and colleges and but, so But uh, Gordon Hirabayashi, uh, when, he, when the Supreme Court announced its decision in, in 1943, he was um, he, he's a very proud man, and he, he it was very important to him that he serve his prison term that he received the punishment that had been uh, given him um, because that was a part of his, his character and, and part, of the, part of the story for him. He wanted to, to be punished. And um, he insisted that he be punished. And the government said, it was the middle of the war. We don't have any way to get you from Seattle, Washington, down to Arizona where you're supposed to serve your sentence. You're supposed to be in a prison camp down there, and we don't have any way to get there. So Gordon Hirabayashi hitchhiked from Seattle down to Arizona so that he could be sure that he would serve that sentence. And now the place where uh, that prison camp uh, was located is now a rest area that is named after Gordon Hirabayashi. But after, our dis after uh, the decisions, our decisions came down, the Congress did pass a bill uh, granting reparations to those right, who had right, been right. interred. And, uh, and that was a whole gr broader group of people, uh, many, many people. Many, everyone. Yeah, and, yeah. and that was uh, considered by the Japanese American community to be a, a recognition of the um, justice of, uh, of their uh, efforts over the years to, um, um, to ha have this injustice recognized. Well, I can't help but repeating the, the, the adage that those who do not study history are doomed to repeat it. And so I congratulate the students for their participation in this project and that they take away from it the, the lesson of history that in times of stress, um, we can, man can be very uh, unjust to his fellow men and women and that the lesson of Hirabayashi and Korematsu is that they had great courage and stood up courageously against that injustice. And that's what uh, we all have to remember and try to do 
as we live our lives in the future. Living it in their lives and being involved in whatever, whether it's their school, their church, their family life, the local society, community, that they set an example and they encourage other people to set the kind of example where we honor everyone, regardless of race, creed, color, sex, uh, sexual orientation, that uh, of the importance of constitutional guarantees for all of, all of our citizens and persons who are living in the United States, even those who are not citizens, but all of us, that we have respect for each other. And uh, we speak with respect and we act with respect to everyone. We hope this video has provided you with additional insights into the constitutional conflicts that continue today between national security and individual rights. Remember, this program is intended to supplement, not substitute, for more in-depth research you may do into the legal and social aspects of the Japanese internment. Thanks for watching and best of luck in the contest.